thoracoabdominal emergencies. I like to color code things by organ. You can see this is how we will break this down. The first group are thoracic emergencies, the next group intestinal emergencies, and lastly, viscous and vessel emergencies. I'm, if you've seen my presentations before, they're usually just straight case presentation, but I thought some additional information about the pathologies we'll be viewing would be helpful for people so you'll see I have the a typical age range and gender distribution, pink for female, blue for male, white for equal in both genders, right? We will do the annual incidence of each of these pathologies per 100,000, that's in green on the second line. I will present icons representing the risk factors in red, the percentage mortality, uh, for that entity. And then last, the CT sensitivity. All of these stats were taken from the uh, NCBI, the National Center for Biometric Information. Postoperative ischemia. This is just a, a huge problem in the emergent imaging world. So I couldn't do a deck without uh, an example of this. More common in men between 30 and 50, but we are, and we are specifically talking about post, post bariatric surgery. You have to be so conscious of complications in patients with bariatric surgeries. I just can't say it enough. It is a major source of QAs, poor patient outcomes, medical malpractice, uh, whatever bad category you want to put this in, it will fit. So this happens in about 5% of people who have had bariatric surgery. So it is not insignificant. And again, uh, warrants a great deal of vigilance on the part of the emergency radiologist. Obviously the uh, risk factor for this is prior bariatric surgery. It's actually got an impressively low mortality, just a couple percent. The one thing I'll warn you about though, is it's still very dangerous. A lot of these patients, even when they do survive, they lose a significant amount of gut, even end up lifelong on TPN or otherwise uh, very expensive medications and uh, really pretty miserable lives. So uh, don't let that low mortality fool you. This is a terrible entity to come down with. CT sensitivity is only about 80%, and I think a significant portion of those 20% that are missed uh, are due to a lack of vigilance and understanding uh, by the radiologist. So hopefully we'll fix that here. So you can see the evidence of bariatric surgery, right? a staple line here just below the GE junction. As we go down here, you can see there's pneumatosis in the left upper quadrant, small bowel loops right there. In addition, the SMV is flattening out and disappearing right here and lower down the SMA vanishes as well and uh, I put one of these on Instagram recently and someone wrote and said is this volvulus or embolism that's causing the occlusion of the SMA and I wrote back and said it's always going to be volvulus in these cases right that's what happens but the question was a good one because the evidence of volvulus is not typically overwhelming. It can be uh, very subtle. And so you won't necessarily see a classic whirlpool sign. So let's check this one out. So here is the gastric stapling, the small bowel loop. Now let's watch that SMV, it disappears. Now let's watch the SMA, it disappears. Right, pinched down significantly. It filled distally. So let's look at that again. There are the staples. There's the uh, transplanted bowel loop. Now look at the SMV. In these cases, the SMV is your best indicator. There's the SMA narrowing and then reconstituting. The SMA, SMV is your best indicator. Why? Because it's the thinnest wall, lower pressure, right? So when it, it's going to be the most sensitive uh, to compression and occlusion. Okay, and you can see the pneumatosis throughout that left upper quadrant, small bowel loop, a lot of dilated bowel throughout the rest of the abdomen. Right, let's look at this one more time. 
watch that SMV snuff out, and then the SMA narrow. There we go. Okay, so that's postoperative ischemia, specifically postbariatric surgery. Case of small bowel obstruction. So this is uh, common in both genders, 55 to 75. The incidence is thankfully fairly low, three or four per 100,000. Surgery is, of course, the risk factor, and overwhelmingly so. Uh, just a, a real problem with intraperitoneal surgeries. When you really start reading on this, uh, you see that they're, they're very tightly connected. Mortality is about 8% on small bowel obstruction, and the sensitivity of CT about 95%. All right, arborizing intrahepatic air, but this time more peripherally located. I don't think anyone would be fooled by that. That's portal venous gas. Now we've got some small bowel wall thickening and clear mesenteric stranding. And there's some extraluminal gas here as well. Right there. Okay, and here the vessels are all contorted. Sorry, more small bowel wall thickening, but here are contorted vessels, which on the movie you'll see clearly are twisting back and forth and uh, are clearly there for a problem. Lastly, there's pneumatosis, which can be tough to spot, but here you see it in the left lower quadrant, obviously dependent portion of the bowel where gas should not be. All right, there's the arborizing portal venous gas. Look at how those loops of bowel are kind of stacked one on top of the other. Uh, that is pretty much a classic appearance of a closed loop obstruction. Uh, when I see the small bowel dilated and stacked like that, I start looking for a central point right, where these are wrapped around. So there was pneumatosis down in the left lower quadrant as well. Look at all that mesenteric stranding. But now let's look at the vessels turning one way oh, and then back the other direction. And there again, left lower quadrant pneumatosis. So let's watch that one more time. There's the portal venous gas. There are the stacked, thick-walled bowel with mesenteric stranding, mesenteric gas. Right, that is overtly ischemic. And then in the left lower quadrant, even more pneumatosis. All right, so that is a closed-loop obstruction with ischemia. And that is always a surgical emergency, even without the mesenteric gas and even without the portal venous gas. Uh, failure to call on a closed loop obstruction is, uh, is up there with some of the greatest sins of radiology. That's one that uh, we are constantly hammering on with our radiologists. All right, a couple of intussusception cases. 50 to 70, uh, gender neutral. Actually, very rare. This is the, uh, actually, I just realized this is just one intussusception case. I've got another one later uh, in a later set. So this is actually the adult intussusception related to uh, colon cancer. And that is thankfully extremely rare. One in a million, in fact. Cancer is, of course, the a uh, risk factor, the mortality from the intussusception itself is very low at around 2%. And the sensitivity of CT is about 80%. Once you have that intussusception, it's frequently very difficult to actually identify uh, the mass causing it. So here is a hypodense liver lesion, clearly a metastasis. And here is the redundant telescoped colon segment will probably appreciate that better on the coronal. So there were the few uh, metastatic lesions. And now here, you can see that kind of target appearance of the intussusceptible portion of the colon. Tough to say what's causing it though. Note there are two liver lesions, uh, multiplicity being the hallmark of metastatic disease. One of the more valuable quotes I've ever read in a radiology textbook. Right, let's look at it on the coronal. So there is that liver lesion. 
but here you can really start to appreciate there's wall thickening in the intussusceptum and in the intussusceptiens, right? And you can see this telescoping up into the more distal portion of the colon. Very nice picture of it. And let's look at that. Right, that's one where you probably could say, I believe there's a mass here. It's really, uh, you, you have to be suspicious when you see an intussusception like this in, in an adult in any case. All right, pretty rare uh, for an adult intussusception. All right, a case of appendicitis, because what intestinal section would be complete without it? Uh, most commonly from the ages of 12 to 40. Incidence is about 10 per 100,000. There may be a slight genetic predisposition to developing appendicitis. I was kind of surprised to find that, uh, although it is kind of weak. Mortality is low. It's about 2%. For all the hype, uh, it's fairly unusual to die of acute appendicitis. And the CT sensitivity is given at 92%. Oop, 91%. So here we have a pretty dramatic case though, colonic pneumatosis. Again, see how it goes all the way around, right? Circumferential gas collection, that is not obeying gravity. So the, those little uh, rounded foci of gas on the posterior aspect of the colon, very suggestive. Here is an appendicolith in a dilated appendix. So I thought the pneumatosis was really worth seeing. There is colonic pneumatosis in association with appendicitis. So that is an infectious colitis. And here is the dilated appendix, thick walled, enhancing, and containing a luminal appendicolith. Few nodes there as well. Plenty of stranding for that matter. All right, so that's an acute appendicitis with infectious colitis. All right, this is a case of pseudomembranous colitis, and this is a good one. So 65 and older, gender neutral. The incidence is high and rising, 35 per 100,000. The risk factors are antibiotic therapy, institutionalization, and underlying inflammatory bowel disease. I thought that interesting, but uh, patients with ulcerative colitis are at greater risk for this. Mortality is about 15%, and the CT is about 85% sensitive. So the most important thing here, well, two very important things. First of all, there is intraperitoneal gas, and it's subtle. There are numerous foci, but they're all small, and they're very important. Obviously, that puts these findings on a whole other plane, and it's something you really have to look for in patients with pseudomembranous colitis. Okay, the other thing to point out is the extensive colonic wall thickening. With pseudomembranous colitis, the wall thickening is basically cecum to rectum. Right? It involves the entire colon and contiguously. And when you see that, I think it is very reasonable to suggest specifically that this is pseudomembranous colitis because there are very few entities that will otherwise do that. And I, uh, I have scored many times uh, through my career with that suggestion. It's uh, almost invariably correct. Okay, the other thing to remember about this is with this extent of colon involvement and this extent of wall thickening, mucosal sloughing, it's just terrible. Uh, there is a very high risk of perforation, and that's how many of these patients ultimately succumb. Uh, so they And they often perforate in just this way, with little tiny foci of gas as the only manifestation. So you can see there are a number of them. I didn't even circle all of them, but still, they're pretty subtle, even taken in total. Right, and I didn't bother circling the colonic wall thickening, but you can definitely appreciate, as I said, cecum to rectum, right? Extensive wall thickening, stranding, uh, mucosal sloughing seen throughout the entire visualized extent of the colon.
And that is a strongly suggestive finding for pseudomembranous colitis.